the vast majority of the different kinds of shells are small, comparable to, to you know, any really large group of animals. If you look at, yes, there are great white sharks, but there are an awful lot more minnows than there are great white sharks. Estimates range from anywhere from 70 to 120,000 known species and easily several times that number that are species yet to be described and discovered. A collection of mollusks here at the National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian, is the largest collection in the world. It's well in excess of 20 million. Cowries are probably one of the most collected groups of shells. People who collect seashells really like cowries, and a lot of people specialize on cowries. So they're they're disproportionately represented in the historically in the what's considered rare and expensive shells, and have been through the ages. These are golden cowries. They're quite popular. Uh, these first came to Europe in the early 1800s during the era of exploration and originally came from Tahiti where they were worn as ornaments by the people of Tahiti and you can see the ones in our collection that were actually worn as ornaments have little holes drilled in the edge. There was a certain lore and mystique to the, that came with these shells. This is a species that is native to the waters around Korea. So when people from the uh, southern Chesapeake area brought this and said, what on earth is this thing? They had never seen anything like this. But it turns out that they had intentionally introduced this from Korea to the Black Sea. And ships that trade from the Chesapeake with the Black Sea would carry coal back and forth. They would take bilge water on in the Black Sea, sail across the Atlantic, dump their bilge, load up with coal. Well, apparently the larvae survived in the bilge water and now every year you know a couple hundred of these turn up. This is a pen shell. It's a bivalve that lives in the Mediterranean in mud. And one of the things it does is that it anchors itself with little protein threads in the sand as an anchor. People would harvest the byssus and they would weave it into threads and this is a a glove made out of pinabyssus. And one of the mythological theories is that Jason's golden fleece was actually uh, something that was woven out of pinabyssus. This was one of the great rarities of the early to mid-18th century. Even Linnaeus thought it was truly exceptional for its beauty. This is one of the cones that was commanded a very high auction premium compared to the Dutch paintings of the day. So this was a notoriously poor investment. Some of my friends who are divers, they say it's really amazing, said you can come to the same place at different times. If you go at dusk, you'll find two or three different kinds of cones. If you come back to the same place after midnight, you'll find two or three different kinds of cones. And if you come back to the same place four o'clock in the morning, you know, right before dawn, you'll find yet a different assemblage of cones. Apparently they work shifts. These are the common whelks. And if you look at these things, you say, well, what's rare about this stuff? It's, you see these on the beach all the time. This is a mirror image. It's sort of like finding that, you know, a two-headed cow or deer or whatever. Yeah, this, is, this is a genuine genetic anomaly. And one of the theories is that they're eaten by crabs, so a crab will take the shell and start peeling back the shell. It's easier to survive a crab attack if you're coiled in the opposite direction. Because of their habitat, they're quite difficult to collect. They tend to live on steep, rocky surfaces. So with a submarine, you just sail up the surface and you see them with a light and you just reach out and pick them up. Now one of these things these animals do is they produce this copious, milky secretion that repels predators. And we're studying that now as, as for potential natural products, chemistry, biomedical implications.